Hi guys, this is Lauren with Lauren Watkins Art and in today's video I'm going to be demoing how to paint a slice of cheesecake using watercolor. Here is a picture of my palette and the colors in my palette are quidacridone red, cadmium red, gamboge, cadmium yellow light, uh, sap green, phthalo green, phthalo blue, ultramarine blue, violet, burnt sienna, and Payne's gray. So those are all the colors in my palette. This is a drawing guide of the picture I am painting. So if you want to screenshot this, pause the video, you can use it as a guide to draw out your cheesecake. Here is a reference photo I am pulling the highlights and some of the shadows from. I'm not painting the picture exactly. I simplified it and I kind of changed the angle on the cheesecake, but it's a great reference to kind of look to when looking for highlights and shadows and things like that. So here is my drawn out picture. Um, I drew that off camera and then I set it up. I taped it to the board so the paper wouldn't warp. And then I have my palette and it's a little bit dirty, but that's okay. I am just doing some, a couple different mixes of yellow and our violet. Yellow and violet are opposite colors on the color wheel, so they make some brown colors when mixed together. So I am using both yellows to make two different brown colors so that I can um, use that as the base for our cheesecake. So I kept it a lot more yellow than purple. I'm going to dilute it out with quite a bit of water. Off screen, before I realized that I was off screen, I started mixing up some burnt sienna and then a little bit of ultramarine blue. This makes kind of a navy blue color if it's mostly ultramarine blue and a little bit of burnt sienna. If it's about a 50-50 mix, it makes gray. And if you use mostly burnt sienna and just a little bit of blue, you make a little bit more of a neutral brown color. So I mixed up a couple different versions of that and then I jumped in with my large paintbrush and I started to wet my paper. This is so I can do a wet into wet wash. A wet into wet wash is when you wet your paper and then you add paint to it and that paint starts to flow and move around and gives you kind of the stereotypical watercolor look. This is a great technique to learn and it is really great for getting those really soft blends. So I am wetting the areas of my cheesecake that I want this paint to go. Anywhere that I do not want the paint to go, I am leaving dry. This is one way for you to control your watercolors. If you've been struggling with paint going out of control on your watercolor picture, this is one of those techniques you can use to help have a little bit of control. But once I wet those areas, I started adding in some of those yellow violet mixes and I'm just dabbing it a little bit and I'm not adding too much in the very center of the cheesecake because the caramelization from when the cheesecake is cooking usually happens along the edges that are exposed to the most heat. So along the crust, along the edges and along the top. I did add a little bit to like the point of the cheesecake, but that was mostly um, so that there would be a little bit more of a shadow. So I did some dabs of that. I didn't want it to be perfectly smooth because cheesecake isn't perfectly smooth. And then I took some blue burnt sienna mix. I ended up tweaking it a little bit and doing a little bit more of a blue base but I am adding that wherever there's going to be a little bit of a shadow on the cheesecake. So I'm just adding it to the right hand side of the little drips and then where there might be some shadows along the texture of the cheesecake itself. This is going to help start to create dimension. When you first start painting, your your pictures don't look quite as realistic and then as you paint and you learn more you start adding more and more details which help it become more and more realistic 
we're not going for photorealistic in this picture, but I used this as an exercise for my intermediate watercolor class to start pay attention to start paying attention to details they see in a picture. Learning how to pay attention to those little details will really help you start to take your pictures to the next level. Um, I had an art teacher that always made us go back and work on our picture more and more and more. Like we'd take a day off and then we'd go back and see what needed to be tweaked. And that practice really helped me start seeing those smaller differences between the picture. I did a few dabs of kind of the more brown mix to kind of vary up the colors and the textures within the main area of the cheesecake. And now I'm taking our brown mix that just had a little bit of ultramarine blue, and I'm starting to add that to the top where the cheesecake caramelized. In the reference photo, it is the same color as the base, but I usually make like a New York style cheesecake that gets caramelized on the top and that's the way I wanted to paint it. I also thought it would help my students in my class because it it made it a different color and made it easier to differentiate um, the two planes of the cheesecake, the top and the side. So you can choose to make it more like the reference photo that way or you can do it like how we're painting it. You can see how the body of the cheesecake was still a little bit wet and some of that brown is kind of like feathering out into the base of the cheesecake. That's because I didn't let it dry all the way. So another reminder that if you don't want bleeding and paint flowing into specific areas, let it dry completely before you paint something next to it, okay? But all I did was just kind of tweak the shape of my cheesecake a little bit and kind of dabbed it up. So I'm just mixing some of that burnt sienna ultramarine blue mix with a little bit of gamboge. This is kind of making a slightly more orange version of that brown and we're going to use that for the crumb crust of our cheesecake. I wanted to differentiate the different browns. Um, so this one has a little bit more of an orange base, maybe to look a little bit more like a graham cracker crust or a pretzel crust or something like that. So I'm just kind of tweaked the base color. I'm not necessarily doing a wet into wet wash for this because I didn't need that level of mixing. And then I let it dry completely. I didn't show the drying process, else this video would take forever. But if you wanna speed up the drying process on a pitcher, you can always use a blow dryer or some kind of heat tool. But I let it dry completely, and now I'm adding a little bit of a shadow underneath our cheesecake, because I didn't want it floating in the abyss. Now, this shadow, I am aware, <laughs> doesn't match the highlights on the body of the cheesecake. So the highlights and the shadows on the main body of the cheesecake are coming from a different angle than where the shadow is on the base of the cheesecake. I painted this picture real quick <laughs> and I didn't really kind of pay attention to that until like after I was done and realized that I needed to have kind of angled the shadow coming off the base of the cheesecake, just a little bit different. It should have been coming towards the front um, of the cheesecake and a little bit more behind it, but it's all right. I was just trying to make it look like the cheesecake wasn't just floating. Once I did a base layer of that blue-gray color, I then let it dry completely, and then I activated my quidacridone red. If you don't have quidacridone red, you can use some kind of other pink red color, so like alizarin crimson would work as well. You just want it to lean a little bit more pink on the color spectrum than orange. 
Then I started adding my base pink color. Um, this could be done as like a true wet into wet wash where you apply clean wet water to your paper and then just drip that paint in. I am doing some kind of hybrid. So I am doing a wet on dry with a pale pink color. So this is just really diluted quidacridone red and I am applying it to dry paper. So that paint isn't going anywhere. And then I will come back over and add more colors. So this paint is wetting the paper. And then when I add layers of color over the top, then it will act almost like a wet into wet wash and those other layers will flow out and blend. So you can take either approach. Sometimes I use this partly so that the areas I'm wetting show up on camera or on the overhead projector when I am teaching in person. So I don't rinse out all the color out of my brush all the way so that they can see the areas I'm wetting on the paper. Sometimes I do this because I am in a hurry and I wanna get kind of a base layer of color. So either way, um, this can be hard if you are using a staining color and you might get paint where you don't want it to be because that color won't lift. So you ch choose the way you wanna do it. But once I did that base layer of pink, then I started coming in and adding some more darker versions of that color. So just a stronger concentration. With watercolor, you use water as like your white in traditional paints. So if you need it, your paint color to be lighter, then you just add water to it. If you want a stronger, more saturated version of that color, then you use less water and you use a higher concentration of paint in the mix. But I am just going in and kind of blocking in these stronger tones of this kind of cherry um, topping on our cheesecake. You can see how that paint kind of flowed and moved and spread out. So now I'm coming back in and adding another layer of these stronger colors and kind of refining the shape. As my paper's drying as I'm working, the paint isn't gonna flow quite as much. This is kind of like a wet on dry. So when you do wet paint on really wet paper, the paint flows and moves quite a bit. But as that paper dries, the paint you add is might just feather a little bit, but it's not going to like flow and move all over the place. And that is what's happening on this stage. Those details I'm adding are softening up along the edges, but they're not moving all over and kind of taking up the whole area. So I'm just building up some more of those layers of the cheesecake and by building up these layers and having highlights and midtones and shadows and have them be in kind of these organic shapes is really going to help make these cherries look more three-dimensional and glossy so not just kind of a three-dimensional shape but like a shiny glossy three-dimensional shape and I'm sorry if you're getting like a lot of like background noise from me. I live in the flight path of an Air Force base and with all the stuff going on in the world right now, there's been a lot more jets and fighter planes and things like that moving and so there's like constant air noise going on above my house. So I'm sorry if that's picking up in the audio. But I'm just continuing looking at my reference photo and looking at where some of the highlights and shadows are on this picture. So this picture is one that I t I'm teaching in my intermediate watercolor class that I teach in person. And I had done a practice piece of this like several months ago when I was deciding what we were gonna paint for the class. 
And then I realized I needed to kind of do another version of that right before I needed to teach so that I could refresh my memory on how I painted it. But with a whole bunch of stuff going on in my personal life, I only had like an hour and a half to paint this before I had to leave to teach that class. So this is how this picture came about. I just hit record and I started painting it so that I could kind of refresh my memory for my class. So it's not as refined or as like detailed as I normally would like it to be, but I do think it's a good starting point for someone that is getting a little bit more familiar with watercolor and wanting to start doing a little bit more detail, starting to make it look a little bit more dimensional. And you might be a little concerned with how like splotchy or like uneven the surface of our cherries are looking right now. That's okay. We are just blocking in some of these details and then we will do glazes of our quidacridone red over the top and that will help smooth and soften some of these lines and edges within the cherries. But I find that sometimes it's easy to do these kind of darker mid-tones at this stage and then glaze the colors over the top to help with vibrancy and to help smooth out some of those details and lines. So while I'm letting those cherries dry, I'm going to come down and work on the crust. So we had done a base layer of our more orangey brown color that was very light. And now we added a little bit of our burnt sienna to that mix that had dried on our palette. And we are taking our medium brush and just doing random splotches and dots and random shapes along this crust in this color. This is gonna start to mimic the texture of that graham cracker crust on the cheesecake. It's not smooth, it's not shiny, there's, it's almost like sand that's been compressed. There's so many different textures and it's uneven and there's lots of little shadows and highlights within it. So we're trying to repli rep replicate that, sorry, um, in this picture. So that's why I'm doing all these little dots and shadows and highlights. And then I took a Payne's gray and, not Payne's gray, an, an ultramarine blue and burnt sienna mix. This one's a little bit more blue. And I'm adding that to the base of our crust. And that's gonna help give a little bit more shadow and depth to it. So it looks like it's kind of some shadows that are on the very base of the crust or the bottom of it. So now I've mixed up this more orange color and I'm using that um, to add just a little bit of vibrancy and to kind of change up some of the undertones within the crust. This will also help it not look too even or smooth. Adding a little burnt sienna to it, a little bit more of our gamboge, or if you don't have gamboge or your gamboge looks a little different than this, you just want a yellow that reads more orange. That's a little bit closer to orange on the color wheel. And I'm just dabbing that in. I did a little layer all over the top with that kind of orangey color we had mixed and that kind of smoothed out some of that texture so it didn't look too spotted. And I'm just going back and forth with these different colors and just creating that texture. Now I'm taking that burnt sienna and I am deepening the colors of the crust on the top of our cheesecake. So just doing a wet on dry technique so the top of the cheesecake is dry and I just did a layer of paint, kind of pulled some of that color down to the sides, applied a few little crumbs that might have broken off the cheesecake when it was sliced and added those and I'm just starting to tweak and refine. I'm taking some blue brown mix and I'm starting to build up shadows along the top of our crust because those cherries are 
leaving some shadows as well. So I'm adding a little bit of shadow to that and that's gonna help those cherries look more dimensional like they're sitting on top of this luscious cheesecake and there's a cast shadow. So you wanna kinda of look at everything and how they all play together because your highlights and your shadows and your shapes are all going to play into each other in helping to create a realistic dimensional object. I hope you guys are liking this little bit more of a long form video. Usually these types of lessons, I keep the video around 20, 25 minutes, but I decided to slow this one down a little bit more than normal so that you guys could really see some more of that color mixing. It's still sped up just a little bit, but I, I didn't speed it up as much as normal. So if it's going too fast for you, always feel free to pause and kind of catch up to where I am. Um, I would suggest kind of watching it through all the way and getting an idea of how it's going to go and then go back through and you can paint it with me and pause it wherever you need to. So now I'm taking some of our yellow violet mixes. It has a little bit of burnt sienna to it and I am working a little bit more on the main body of this cheesecake. Anywhere that I was getting too harsh of lines um, from this color that I'm adding, I'm taking a damp, wet, um, or a damp, clean paintbrush and just kind of spreading that paint out and absorbing anything extra. But really starting to get a little bit more shadow and dimension. Because the cheesecake is fairly light and our background is kind of this pure white color, we did have to darken up the cheesecake just a little bit than what it may appear in a picture that has really dark backgrounds. This is because our perception of value and color are greatly influenced by what is next to it. So sometimes you can have a color that looks super, super dark because it is next to all light colors. And then you can take that exact same color and move it next to really, really dark, almost black colors. And that color could read as a highlight. So just keep that in mind and don't get discouraged if you have to go back through and darken something up because it started to, it started to be too light once you added the other colors and values around it. This is also why color can change. A color might read one way when it's next to these other colors, but it might read too green or too blue or too yellow when put next to other ones. And that's just part of color theory. So don't be discouraged. Just if you see that something is still too light, just darken it up or maybe you went too far and you made it too dark and you need to lighten it up a little bit. With watercolor, it's a little bit more tricky, but you can always take a wet, damp paintbrush and kind of scrub at that area that is too dark and then blot it off with a clean paper towel. And that will help lift up some of that color and lighten that value up a little bit. You might not be able to lighten it up all the way, but you might be able to lift it up enough to kind of save your picture. Speaking of highlights, we are refining some of the highlights on the cherries. And you can see I'm adding this very pale, kind of purpley blue color. That is because the highlights in the reference photo that we're loosely basing this off of read almost blue. And it's just kind of the way the lighting is playing off of the red color of the cherries. So I am just adding a little bit of blue around kind of the outer rings of these highlights to kind of help create a little bit more variation. This will also help them read a little bit more dimensional. Once that dried, I then started glazing over our cherries. So. I'm taking our quid red and I am doing a layer of it 
all over our ch cherries and kind of that sauce that's dripping down the side. And this is going to help smooth it out. Now, when you are doing a glaze, make sure your paper is completely dry before you start it. Because if you try to do one while your paper's wet, it's more likely to reactivate those paints underneath it and you might get a muddy mess. Also, you don't wanna have to go back and forth and scrub it, else it will start lifting like what we talked about before. So mix your color on your palette and do a nice smooth layer of that color. Just lay it down, don't push hard, don't scrub it back and forth, don't go over it a lot of times, and then just let it be. While, after I did that uh, kind of glaze over the cherries, I am gently dabbing in some more of those shadow colors while it's still wet so that they can feather out a little bit. I am not using very much water and I'm using mostly kind of like a dabbing motion to add that color in because I don't want to kind of scrub it up and like mess up anything underneath it. But this is just allowing me to get a little bit softer of an edge on some of those shadows I'm adding to my picture. And by having that whole spectrum of values, having these darks, having these highlights, and then a wide spectrum of midtones, I'm really starting to get that dimension in our cherries. So in my intermediate watercolor class, um, we really started to see how value and color really helped make these objects look even more dimensional. All of my students got a copy of the drawing guide and the reference photo before class, and many of them chose to just trace the same image that you saw at the beginning, which is completely all right. When you're learning a new skill like um, improving your watercolor skills, sometimes simplifying other things like not stressing about having to draw it out is makes this more manageable. So they trace the image, they have the same base image as me, but as we were working, um, some students um, might've got colors a little too dark too quickly or not dark enough. And we really got to see how that affected how dimensional our cheesecakes looked. Um, I had one student mention that my picture in class looked a lot glossier and shiny, especially along the drips. And it was because when I was looking at her picture, her drips were kind of the same color as the cherry and were really dark. So you didn't get a little bit more of that translucent effect of the cherry glaze dripping down the side. And you also didn't get those highlights of the light reflecting off of that. And that affected how glossy her cherries looked in the long run. I had another student say, you know, it doesn't look as dimensional. Well, their shadows, the cast shadows from this glaze dripping down the side were a lot lighter. And so those shadows weren't showing up, um, especially once they added all the other darker colors around it those shadows weren't strong enough to make the cherry, the drips and everything look like they were big enough to be causing a shadow, if that makes sense. So we, we really got an understanding of how you might have to tweak or adjust values as you're working. But I'm just coming in, I've switched to my smallish brush, my smallest brush, there we go. And I am starting to refine a few more of those details, getting some of those darker shadows in and really refining them. I'm really looking at my reference photo to look at the shape of them so that they follow the curves of the cherries. And with so many different cherries, you have things kind of curving in all, like all over the place. So really look at your reference photo, look at the shapes of the shadows and the highlights and reflect that in your painting. That way 
your curves are also and your line work and everything is helping to reinforce the shape of your object you can see like a lot of those shadows and everything i'm adding to these cherries kind of curve instead of going just kind of straight up and down or straight left and right and by curving it it's reinforcing the idea that these cherries are round and dimensional objects I can tell it's been a few weeks since I've done a voiceover because and that this is a long video because my <laughs> voice is starting to go um, another thing to keep in mind when you are trying to paint something realistic is to take your time like this one was fairly rushed just because of what was going on but if you are kind of stuck and you don't know what needs to be adjusted or tweaked or say you love it and you think you're done, just take a break from it for a little bit and then come back later. And if you still think it looks great and you don't wanna adjust anything, then sign it and leave it be. If you take a break because you're frustrated, you might come back to it with fresh eyes and be better able to spot what needs to be tweaked or adjusted. When we get tired or fatigued from like looking at the reference photo and trying to paint it, our brains kind of just glaze over and they're like, I think it, I don't, I don't know what's going on. I think we should just quit or crumple up the picture. <laughs> and so just take a break when you start feeling like that and then come back to it. Because if you're feeling frustrated and kind of tired of working on this picture, you're going to end up making mistakes that are a lot harder to fix later on and you'll be even more frustrated with yourself. I can't tell you how many times I would work on a picture and I'd be frustrated with it and I'd keep working, keep working, keep working instead of just taking a break and stepping away from it. And then I'd finally step away from it and come back the next day and I'd be like, why? Why did I do that? Because the fix for the problem that was initially bothering me kind of came to me and I realized what I could have done, but instead I kept working on it and fussing with it and then I made it way harder to fix or adjust. Um, I actually <laughs> did that in a pastel piece a couple weeks ago. If you want to check out what I, I paint like when I'm frustrated, um, I would not recommend it. So now I'm trying to kind of change up some of the texture on our cheesecake. Um, so I am deciding to dry brush. So I'm taking some of those colors that are on my palette, some of the yellows, some of the pale browns, and I am dry brushing. So the paint's pretty wet on my palette. So I'm dabbing it off on a paper towel off screen. And then I am dry brushing some texture onto the cheesecake. And that's just going to help it kind of differentiate itself from the rest of the cheesecake in like the other aspects like the crumb crust and the smooth brown um, top of the cheesecake and the glossy cherries. Switching up the textures really can help differentiate objects within your picture. So I'm just doing a lot of that within this picture. Um, dry brushing can feel like you're not doing anything <laughs> For a while, you could work on something and you're like, is this even depositing color? But just keep at it and see if it changes. Because sometimes it just takes a few strokes and layers for it to really start to show up. Now I'm coming in and with a brown and just darkening up some of the shadows on the main crest, drawing a little bit of blue for the cast shadow on the point of our cheesecake and really just building up these last two details. Now I am taking our quadac, not our quadacridone red, our cadmium red, our more orangey red, and I'm doing some just thin glazes of that over some areas of our, our glossy cherries. Um, I love painting reflective objects. That's like one of my absolute favorite things to paint. And so I, I tend to find a few things like that to paint within my classes that I teach in person. But I'm adding this kind of 
orangey red to help with maybe some of the vibrancy and to kind of create subtle changes in color within the cherries. So just really very gently going over again, making sure I don't have too much water on my brush and something to keep in mind, not all of your highlights have to be pure white. So some of them might be like a pale pink in this case, or they might be light blue or light violet, but they're lighter in value. They're closer to white than some of the colors around them. And not all of the highlights are going to be the same value either. So now I am taking this really diluted purple color and I am just using it to kind of fine tune some highlights and shadows within the cherries of this picture. Now, something to keep in mind when you are trying to level up your painting to the next level or you're trying to paint something more realistic, the first 85, 90% of your picture will take just as long as the last 10 to 15% of your picture. That is where you really start to get these details refined. You spend more time looking at your reference photo than you do your painting and you move a lot more carefully. You are a lot more specific about the colors you mix and the shape of the, the area you're painting and the size of it and the things around it. And so you naturally just move a little bit more slowly to really get those details in. And that willingness to put in the time to do that last 10% of the painting can really be what sets two pictures apart or sets one artist apart from another or can be what makes the difference in leveling up your art to the next level. Um, last year, my beginner class was working on some red capped mushrooms and I have a video here on the channel and we painted the mushrooms and they were having so much fun getting those details and really seeing how far they could take it in the realm of realism that we actually spent a whole extra week working on those mushrooms because they felt like they were going to learn more about um, taking their skills and their artwork to the next level by really focusing on those details instead of just taking it 85% of the way there and calling it done, we really sat and focused on that aspect of the painting. And we are on the homeward stretch of this cheesecake and obviously we could take it even further than what it is now. Um, but I was feeling like I was pretty close to where I was going to be happy with it for the class. I was learning what I needed to learn about color mixing and layering so that I could go teach the class. But I decided to take my white gel pen and add a few little highlights to the areas I wanted to reinforce kind of that reflective quality. And when I added those highlights, it kind of helped me see what other things needed to be tweaked or adjusted. The nice thing about doing a gel pen like this is if I don't like it, I can just layer some paint over the top and it kind of dissolves into the paint and no one would know I added that gel highlight. But it really helped me see what things needed to be a little bit darker and what things maybe needed to be a little bit lighter or a color needed to be adjusted or, or whatnot. So I... Um, did those little kind of gel pen lines and then I came back and I started to do the last few tweaks and adjustments to this painting. And again, 
This is just for an intermediate level class. We're not going for like super advanced techniques or anything like that. We're just trying to learn how to level up our picture to the next level. And then the other thing we were talking a lot about was texture. So we talked a lot about creating a reflective texture within our picture and a bumpy, irregular texture and something that's a little bit more swoopy and like soft, like the main center of the cheesecake. So we were learning at, about how to create these different types of textures within our painting. And just tweaking and adjusting, just using some more of the reds and the violets. The most time consuming thing on this cheesecake was this reflective cherry glaze topping just because there's so many shadows and so many highlights and getting the shape of them can really make the difference on how realistic they look. My main focus was just to try and make it look like you wanted to like stick your finger and like and like lick it. Um, I added a little bit of like polka dot texture to the brown top of the cheesecake just so it didn't read too smooth. And since it was kind of tone on tone, um, it kind of just blended in, but just gave a subtle color texture. I made sure to add some shadows on the little crumbs that kind of fell off the cheesecake crust just so those don't look like they're floating out in an abyss. And I'm just doing those last few details. And I'm just using my tiny paintbrush for this. Um, the paintbrushes I'm using are Transon paintbrushes. They're the copper handled ones. I just purchased them off of Amazon. And I found that these are a great paintbrush for traveling because they're a natural hairbrush, they hold lots of water, they have a nice point to them, they're generously sized, um, and they're really inexpensive. So if they get damaged while traveling, I'm not as upset as I would be if my $50 um, black velvet brush got damaged. So those are the paintbrushes that I use when I'm typically teaching. Often when I am teaching for my watercolor classes, I am using Strathmore 400 paper. Um, that is kind of just my base paper I use. It's what most of my students are using. And so I try to use things that are typically on the same level of what they have. That way they can't say, oh, you have better supplies, that's why you painted better. If I'm using the same exact supplies they are, then they can remember that this is just a practice and technique thing, not a I need more expensive supply thing, if that makes sense. But for this practice piece, I was using what I had on hand because I had left my Strathmore um, paper pad in my car. So this is the Canson Heritage Paper. And this was actually one of my first paintings I've done on that kind of paper. And it's 100% cotton paper, very similar to Arches. Um, not as textured as Arches cold press paper, but um, really lovely paper to work on. So if you're trying to find a new type of paper to experiment on and have some fun with, I really did like the heritage paper. But here is the painting with the tape off. It's one of my favorite things to see is all the paper coming off the picture. And then I dug out my Micron pen and signed it. So that is kind of the intermediate level um, cheesecake picture. If you like this longer form watercolor tutorial, let me know, or let me know if you prefer the like 15, 20 minute length videos where it's a little bit more sped up and I'm just giving a more quick overview of what I'm doing. But I hope you guys have a fantastic day and I will see you next time. Bye.